This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. Well, this week we have another past national president of the Society of American Magicians, Mr. Mike Miller. Mike actually books a lot of talent for many conventions, whether it's the SAM convention, the Magic Texas conventions coming up, Abbott's get together, uh, the um, Salute to Magic in New York, as well as the Super Sunday and other kinds of places, and sometimes even stage manages. So it's kind of interesting to find out kind of his thinking about what he does whenever he actually does book these acts. And also he has produced several tours of China with uh, several magicians who have gone over the overseas and have done 20, 30, 40 different theaters uh, throughout China. So we're going to discuss that then a little bit then as well in this week's episode. He is also going to be, because of his uh, expertise and what all that he has done in contributing to the magic community at large is going to be receiving a special fellowship from the Academy of Magical Arts to the Magic Castle coming up on May 17th. So congratulations, big congratulations over there then, Mike, for getting this special honor. That's uh, quite a privilege. And yes, uh, I'm going to be receiving one as well that same evening, a uh, special fellowship. So I'm uh, thankful to all of you listeners who have supported me over the years and have brought me to this point where I've actually gotten the recognition by the Academy. So I'm going to soon be saying something that uh, I've always wanted to say since I was a child, and that is, I would like to thank the Academy for this award. <laughs> so it's going to be a lot of fun coming up then too. Anyhow, Mike and I have been friends for a long time, and I think that you'll get something out of this if you're interested in getting booked at conventions about maybe how to go about it and what his thoughts are and how he got to be the producer that he is, and just uh, also his friend, uh, being friends with John Dornbos, who is or was an NFL player for the Philadelphia Eagles and now is a full-time professional magician doing just wonderful. And we talk a little bit about that. This is a great podcast episode. I know that you're going to enjoy. Please welcome my guest this week, Mr. Mike Miller, here on The Magic Word. <music> Today, I've got with me a guest who is someone who is a, a successor, actually. Uh, he has uh, been booking magic acts for a long number of years for the Society of American Magician, but he's also been doing this for the uh, Abbott's Get Together, as well as uh, Super Sunday and uh, some other events then as well. And he uh, is a uh, uh, performer and lecturer, somebody who uh, is in the Philadelphia area. He's performed over at uh, the Smoke and Mirrors Theater for uh, currently over 75 times. So he gets around a lot, but he also, when I say produces shows, he uh, has produced a show that uh, over in China for a number of years, tours uh, throughout China. We'll get a chance to uh, chat with him a little bit about that. But what I'm most uh, excited about also is that he's going to be, uh, because of what he has accomplished then so far over the past uh, several years of his life and the... Um, uh, wealth of information that he has is being recognized by the Academy of Magical Arts, the Magic Castle, with a special fellowship that he'll be receiving then in May. So uh, please welcome my friend and yours, Mr. Mike Miller. Hi there, Mike. How are you? All right. How are you doing? Thanks for uh, <laughs> having me. I'm glad that we got a chance to uh, chat. One thing I did forget as far as uh, this very important, of course, you're a past national president of the Society of American Magicians then as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that probably yeah. was how that you got uh, involved working with uh, Hank Morehouse. Well, no, in 1996, I think it was six or nine, 96 in Boston, the SEM convention in Boston, Hank Morehouse and Brad Jacobs. Well, I was working uh, at the uh, Super Sunday, booking all that for years and running the shows and all on uh -huh. uh, Bob Little Super Sunday, which is now mine. And um, he, Hank was always there, would come every convention and he saw what I was doing. And one day he comes up to me, him and Brad Jacobs, and asked me, if I can help uh, Bruce Chadwick backstage. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And they said, how much you want? I said, I'll do it for free. No problem. I just want to learn. Yeah. And Bruce, Bruce taught me a lot. Bruce taught me a lot on stage managing. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I've stage managed uh, FISM 2009 gala shows. Wow. I, I stage managed Magic Live several times, a uh, bunch tons of SAM conventions, the Salute to Magic in New York City. 
um, quite a bit. Now I'm stage, I am stage stage managed FISM close-up last year, mm -hmm. and I'm heading right after the awards in L.A. to uh, FISM Europe in Italy to stage manage with Joan Caesar the uh, close-up competition for Europe. Wow. So your plate is pretty full with uh, a lot of stuff you're yeah, doing for yeah. magic conventions and everything too. I'm not a, and I'm not a stage manager. I what well, I've never had uh, proper training, meaning mm -hmm. I never went to school for lighting or right. sound or anything like that. I've learned everything basically with working with the SEM and Bruce Chadwick. And just from experience that you have uh, gained that, then of course, yeah. just kind of uh, the school of hard knocks of having yes. to do that. And listening, <laughs> listening to the acts and what they want. You know, I think that's a very important thing of being able to listen. you got a key right there is uh, if, if you're trying to do it your way, it's not going to get done the proper way. The acts know what they want. 90% mm -hmm. of the acts know what they want. So do, do most of them uh, come uh, to rehearsal and pretty much know their music and what they want? And, and are they yes. are they good to work with for the most part? Or are they difficult in some others? Uh, there's a few. Mm -hmm. But no, most of them, high percentage in the high 90s are probably easy to work with. I have no issues working with people. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one act, one or two acts. But other than that, everything else is, uh, well, let me get my hand out there. Everything else is fine. I mean, I, I really haven't had any issues. And my number one thing is to let them know I am going to do my best to get their cues down. Things sure. do happen, but I will try my best not to let anything happen to your cues so and i tell them the, right up front is that the number one thing that you try to do as stage manager i want to make sure that they know hey things do happen we'll try to limit issues whatsoever but things do happen live during the show uh i can tell you one thing uh magic live several years ago um the actual house lighting designer was on her phone during one of the acts and she leaned forward and hit a light cue that she wasn't supposed to hit. Oops. And I, I didn't, I didn't blame it on her. I took the blame, mm -hmm. but the only way I found out, cause I was looking at my sheet is Nick Lang. I don't know if you know who Nick Lang is. And ring a bell. Nick Lang lives in Vegas. He's probably one of the best lighting designers in the world. He's a young kid. Um, and he was there and he noticed it and he hit her, he tapped her real quick and changed it before it ruined something. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank God he was there. But, you know, you, as the stage manager, I have to take the blame. So I never, this several years ago, so I, I never said anything during the show or even yeah. after the show. I just took the blame. As stage manager, what what all do you, I mean, obviously manage, I guess, everything, but uh, you have everybody reporting to you or do you have like sheets you give people what to do or do you have well, meetings? I or? have sheets. And when we're do going through the tech rehearsal, I write down the, we design the lighting for their act as we're go uh, going through tech rehearsal. And I would set it as a number, like mm -hmm. Q1, like Q5, standby, standby curtain. So my job was to call all the cues. Go music, go curtain, go like Q1. And everything was on a go. Yeah. It, it, now, when you were talking about Magic Live, of course, you're working in Las Vegas where they have professionals and sometimes right. they have union workers or whatever. And so they know pretty much what they're doing and they work with other professional stage managers then right. as well. So, And she was very good. It's mm -hmm. just that she got caught up and was on her phone for a second and it just leaned forward and hit a, num hit a button. Right. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but but in working with them, people, you, you have to actually get their respect then as well. So how do you go about trying to get that? As soon as I walk in, we I introduce myself. I said, when's your first break? I'll buy pizza. And then mm -hmm. I buy pizza for them and a case of beer for afterwards. Yeah. So I, wanna, I want the, the crew to think, to be able to work with them. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to feed them. Yeah. Do you help set up and tear down? I mean, like, uh, I know like at Abbott's that when you got Mark Holstein that's uh, working with them, it seems like he's always busy. Yeah, well, he's always busy because he's bringing in the lighting and the curtains and everything. Mm -hmm. at, at Orleans or most of the theaters, they already have everything there. So there's nothing to break down other than the illusions 
if there's an illusion act or something. So when we were in New Orleans, for an example, at the SAM convention uh, last year, and we were at a uh, high school high gymnasium, school. as I recall, mm -hmm. there wasn't really too much no, to put up was, a strike. No, it wasn't a gym. It wasn't a gymnasium. It was an actual performance theater. It was a theater. Uh, okay. Yeah, and they had basically everything we needed. Lighting, sound, mm -hmm. everything. So. so when you come in, you have to actually have some knowledge of the sound and light board, which differ from place to place, I would think. Uh, not really, because normally if I'm going in there, they already have a lighting designer and someone on the light board, someone on the sound. So all we have to do is get all the cues together, make sure that the sound's on a and, uh, a thumb drive or they downloaded the music on the computer and we put it mm -hmm. in order of the show. So And magic shows mostly are just one-nighters. Yeah. And you have four or five, six acts. So you're going through and you just tell the people at the theater this is what we have it's not a standard show that you would see day by day by day every day this is a one-nighter and we just go as fast as we can as much as we you know do the best we can mm -hmm. well talking about uh, music i remember uh, working with uh, uh, john calvert uh, some obviously some years ago but he had cassette tapes and he was okay yep. change out this tape push this button and everything and so i'm mm -hmm. sure that there are some people still that you work with that have some archaic uh, technology <laughs> i worked with john calvert and yes i know what you're talking about i mm -hmm. local club he came in with bill rousher yeah and uh at bill rousher's church and i had to run the music and everything but yes um i I don't know if you know Tiny Bubble, Steve Daly. Oh, Steve, yes, Steve, they have a great friend. Mm -hmm. MAS convention, he comes up to me and hands me an A track. And <laughs> he was serious? serious. And I'm like, he no, he he played it up. It was a practical joke on me. Oh. <laughs> but it was years ago, and I'm like, what's this? <laughs> this is my music. I'm saying, well, you're gonna have to get it over onto a cassette or something. He goes, no, that's what I had. And he just played it up for a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. He was great. Yeah, he was great. So that's the best practical joke if you want to do on a <laughs> any uh, stage manager or running music or anything. <laughs> yeah. Now, in some of these cases, of course, whenever you are managing, the, doing the stage managing and everything backstage, uh, but you have also been responsible for booking the acts who are performing that evening then. So they probably have a pretty good idea. I mean, you worked with them before. Yes. Yeah. What I try to do is um, there are a lot of acts I haven't worked with. What I do when I produce a show lately is I will find themes. And the reason I come up, a lot of people don't like theme shows, but the reason I come up with a theme show for a magic convention is say I have the magic of Spain. Mm -hmm. Say if Dal Sanders wants to work that show, you're not from Spain. That's my out. Nice way of getting out of it. Sure. Booking someone. Uh, the Heart and Soul of Magic was a show that shine randy shine put together years ago in philadelphia all african-american performers mm -hmm. and that was a way of making sure you know when we did it at the scm several times that was my way of saying well you're you aren't african-american so you cannot be on the show although denny haney was the only caucasian that was on that show because he was a perfect mc for that show years ago mm -hmm. well, that so yeah that go ahead uh, that would be difficult, I would think, in order to, to have the, the friendship you do with people all over the world who are saying, hey, can I be on the show or, you know. Happens all the time. And I just turn around and said, well, you don't go with the theme or I already have an act similar, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, Hank Morehouse taught me years ago uh, when he was grooming me to take over for China as well as the SAM years ago. Uh, in between Hank and myself was R.G. Smith. So, uh, and when R.G. stepped down, that's when I came in. But Hank said he wouldn't, he didn't like hiring an act within a 600 mile radius of the the uh, venue. You mean who resided, uh, who lived within? He resided that... within 600 miles. Okay. Unless it was a big name. Uh, Las Vegas, book acts from Las Vegas, whether they live there or not. So that was a, that was a uh, that was an exception. Let's put it that way. Yeah, in Las Vegas. Okay. But, yeah. Because, um, yeah. Yeah. At, at the TOMSAM this year, if you notice, they're all overseas at. 
Right. Yeah. Magic Texas looks like it's going to be, of course, it's a great convention, but uh, there are very few acts from within the continental U.S. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That I, uh, the only one I, uh, I don't think I booked anyone from the U.S. on the two main gala shows that I'm doing, as well as the close-up show. Yeah. Because um, I wanted to bring in, it's a FISM North American Championship, and I want the uh, North Americans to see what FISM Act should be like. Right. And because we haven't done well, North America hasn't done well, although we've had several winners, meaning Lance Burton, Sean Farquhar, Rick Merrill, um, what, Johnny Ace Palmer? Yes. Uh, a few, but that's basically it. Shin Lin. Yeah, it's just uh, been a handful. Only been a handful, but if you look at Korea, uh, the, the Korea, South Korea, every one of them can compete and possibly win. Right. So, yeah, there's well, a different way that they think overseas. Will there be people competing in the North American Championships who will be from Asia? I have no clue. They can, though, can't they? I, if, to be honest with you, I really don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the rules are regarding that. Uh, yeah. if, if if you don't win in your if own... If they're a member, yeah. if they're a member of SAM, IBM, uh, Academy of Magical Arts, or CAM, they probably could. Yeah, right. That's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, I think all the rules are on the website uh, over there then as well. When you, uh, you you talked about the the China tour that you had received or been heir to from uh, from Hank, mm -hmm. Hank had been running that for how many years before? He was only, um, I think he started in 2008. Okay, so not that long. And then he was the show producer for FISM Beijing. And he worked with Mr. Lin, who is a retired, he was the head of the Chinese Acrobat Association in China. And he retired, I think, in 2007 or 2008. So he was the chairman of FISM China, Beijing. And um, Hank brought me in to stage manage. Uh, but I was going anyway as the president of the SAM in 2009. Mm -hmm. So SAM gives their president a... Uh, stipend like a fee to travel there and represent the SAM well since I was being paid through FISM in China I didn't take that money from the SAM I let them you know mm -hmm. keep it in the in the thing and I just went there and I worked as the president of the SAM and stage managed the gala shows without taking the money from the station right how did that come about though do you know what the history is I'm kind of curious about how that someone got to uh, like Hank or anybody, do you got to uh, put something together I, like that? Um, I think Hank and Mr. Lin became good friends after me at another FISM. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just talked. And I think Mr. Lin really liked what Hank did and hired him. And oh, then Hank just talked to him, talked to him about me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and Mr. Lin had a lot of respect for Hank. And anything that Hank wanted to do, he was allowed to do. I'm just curious about that being a communist country, about how it would be, how, you know, that kind of came together, because I would think, you know, the, the democratic uh, uh, profit making thing versus what the communism uh, regime would be. I think it'd be difficult. Well, Mr. Lin was part of the government because he was okay. the head of the Chinese acrobat. I think he was a uh, uh, the secretary of the Chinese acrobat association. And there's a lot of that are basically secretary of agriculture or mm -hmm. uh, Chinese acrobats was basically a form of art that they really um, pushed. So it was part of the government. The theaters that we worked in were basically government-owned, poly grand theaters. And there's maybe over 70, 80 poly grand theaters all throughout China. Hmm. And that's the theaters we would go into. So... Um, when Hank, Hank left in, I think we honored Hank in 2011 at the SAM convention in Buffalo. So, and Hank was going to China to start the tour. And on that tour was Miguel Puga, uh, and, um, David Williamson. So when Hank went out there before he left, he calls me up and said, Mike, um, I'm ready when I'm ready to retire. 
or if something were to happen to me, will you be interested in taking over this China tour? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, nothing's going to happen. You're going to do it for a while. He goes, nah, I'm getting up there in years. I'm ready. So we went over there. Back just in time for the SEM convention in Buffalo where we we're going to honor him. Well, I uh, a couple of days before I left for Buffalo, I uh, my number one thing I like to do, relax, is fishing out in the ocean. So I went out fishing in the ocean by myself on a party boat with a bunch of other people, but I don't know who they were. I just went out there to relax, and I got a phone call from David Williamson in China saying that Hank passed away in Beijing backstage. Wow. Is there a way we can get a hold of Jackie, his wife? Yeah. Uh, um, so I called I called my wife, and she was trying to make get some phone numbers for me. And then uh, we called uh, Abbott's Greg Borner, who was very close with Hank. And uh, I think uh, and David Wilson also got a hold of Greg. And Greg drove over to Hank's house and sat down with uh, Jackie and told her. So, but th once that happened, uh, a couple months later, I get an email from Mr. Lynn saying, as you know, we lost our good friend Hank Morehouse. And before he passed, he asked us, he told us about you, and we were wondering if you were interested in taking over this tour. And I said, well, I will do my best. I'll try to make them proud. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, from that moment on, the first year, they only let me bring in one performer, and that was Rocco. Yeah. And then the next year, I brought in Shin Lin before mm -hmm. he became big. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Shin Lin. Shudagawa, Miguel Puga, Henry Evans, and Henry Evans wasn't on that one. Um, it was those four: uh, Miguel Puga, Shin, Shin Lim. Oh, um, uh, Javi Benitez. I think it was Javi Benitez. Okay. Uh, had Shin second. Shin. I told him I need more than a 10-minute dream act. And he was like 20 at the time, eight, 19, 20 at the time. And his mother was very hesitant, letting him go. And I got really close with her, and I talked with her, and I explained everything to her. And I would call her up every day leading up to it, letting her know this is what's going to happen. And then I had Shin come to the SAM convention. I think it was in St. Louis then. I'm not sure, but it was um, – I had him come to a convention, and I'm on the Milburn Christopher Foundation board. Yeah. And I made it shin for an uh, up-and-coming young magician. He received the award, and received the award he was there, so him and I flew together to China. So I was able to you know watch him then, and I said, I need more than 10 minutes. He put his 52 Shades of Red back together. But it wasn't perfect. Had him second spot. Then after the second show, Miguel Puga, Shudagawa, and everybody worked with him. We had him closing the show the rest of the tour. That's hmm. how good it was. Wow. He just picked everything up and just took off. Why was his mother a little bit reluctant to have him go over? Young. Kind of, he wasn't new in the magic. I think he was only a couple of years in the magic back then. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's her, it's her son, it's her baby. Sure. So she was worried, and uh, we, he had some great experiences. Um, he was very forgetful in a lot of things. He left his phone on the bus several times. <laughs> then one time, I found it and I held it for three days. <laughs> told, you know, and, and then we got a. Uh, Mr. Lin's wife went and got a box and resealed his phone inside that box like she just bought him a brand new phone and he was gleaming from ear to ear and then when he realized what it was he was all embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's funny I but remember... it was one of the best things for him to go to that uh, tour because it just made him so much better and I'm sure it also gave him a lot of confidence as well it gave him a lot of confidence because that's after his carpal tunnel surgery on his hands, too. Mm -hmm. 
I remember uh, when he had won first place, uh, I want to say at the IBM convention, and I had mentioned that in my podcast, and I got a uh, message from his mother uh, saying, I had to learn this from you, from your podcast, because he hadn't called me and told me about his yeah. her, 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 the breaking news from on your podcast. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of funny. Her and I talk every once in a while. You know, I send her, you know, messages every once in a while. So we talk quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Not quite a bit, but enough. Uh, I met her for the first time after like four or five, six years after China. Yeah. In Vegas. So I went to the uh, Shin show with her and her her husband and brother. Mm -hmm. I have asked you this before, but since we're recording this now, I just want the rest of the world to, uh, to hear this as well, because I was wondering about how that close up would be seen in, in China. And you were saying they were rock stars, I guess, and standing ovations and big screen TVs and posters. And it's hard to imagine the U S the kind of acceptance they had over there. So can you tell me a bit about that? It would be, it would be a 20, uh, Shin's tour, it went to 30 cities. So we did 30 different cities throughout the east coast of China, whether we were flying, taking a bus or a train. Uh, we would travel every day from, from one city to the next. If we had two days in between, we would do some uh, sightseeing. But um, yeah, everywhere you looked, time it was Rocco, myself, from Germany. We were hopping on a, tr- a subway to go somewhere. All of a sudden, we're walking through the subway. We see our poster hanging up just just in the subway. Mm-hmm. It was unbelievable. So everywhere you looked, there was posters uh, talking the size of uh, a story building, one or two story building. Uh, it was very interesting and well, very well received. The close up part was done with video projection. So we would have a camera on stage and a camera out in the audience, and we would have, I would say, a 30-foot video screen. Most of it would be uh, HD, so it was Mm -hmm. very clear. Some of the theaters weren't as clear, but uh, it was very well received. Um, We've had acts like Alana. She did several acts, which was stage. So everybody could see it, but it would still be on the video screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christopher Hart did it several times. Shooter Gallet did his uh, Pollard's act there several times. Uh, the close-ups was uh, Miguel Puga, Javi Benitez, um, they, uh, Richard Turner killed. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, they didn't believe he was blind, so they made him put a blindfold on one show. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, Paul Gertner, like I said, Paul Gertner, um, Shente from Japan. Mm-hmm. There are several times. Amazing. He is unbelievable. And he's going to be at Magic Texas. Yeah. I remember him from Abbott's. It was just awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's, in my opinion, he's one of the best card magicians around. And it's so theatrical. You opened up a bunch of things that I want to ask about. One was the promotion that you talked about, the posters. Was that tour promoted by the communist government, basically, or who promoted that, put out the posters and did all the so- ticket sales, et cetera? Uh, be honest with you, I really don't. I think it was all the theaters. Okay. I couldn't tell you if it was the government promoting it or not. I really don't know. Okay. But your deal was you got like X dollars rather than a percent, I assume. So what I did was, um, what each act would make. Mm -hmm. I would tell the acts, this is what you're going to walk away with Mm -hmm. and it'll be cash. So I'll wire the money to your bank account and they'll give you some cash to take home. But it would be cash, whether it's American or European. Mm-hmm. And uh, you won't have to pay for food, hotel, travel. They'll take care of your visa. So they took care of everything. And then if I wasn't – I performed on four of the tours, 2011 to 2019. And we also did a stage tour as well. Oh, okay. Uh, it was uh, during the months of uh, September into November. And that tour, we had Rick Wilcox from the U.S., uh, Michael Grasso from the U.S., and then several times. At who? Yonke, Sorry? Topaz. Topaz, okay. Yeah, Topaz several times. Timo Mark was also on the close-up and the stage. Mm-hmm. Logan, Billy, 
Uh, oh, Brad is from the U.S. Who did pretty well there? Who was that? You cut out on me. Aaron Raditz. Oh, Aaron Raditz. Mm -hmm. He's from, uh, I think, well, he's from Branson now, but I think he's originally from Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was some good stage tour shows as well. And uh, another question, obviously, that people will ask is, how did you go about selecting who you did? I would go up and t after seeing acts like at 4F, other conventions, or Magic Live, I would go up and introduce myself. And most of the people, a lot of the people don't know me. Mm -hmm. They, uh, so they're a little reluctant to give me things. So I say, well, contact so-and-so and he'll vouch for me. And they would send me information and then I would forward it to Mr. Lynn. And Mr. Lynn wanted FISM winners. He wanted award winners because that's how mm -hmm. the tour was supposed to, you know, that's, they wanted names of uh, magicians from around the world. So I would, actually throw in some names that weren't award uh FISM winners that were like Shenpei never won a FISM award. But I kinda lied and told him that he placed in FISM. Okay. <laughs> and he was and he was a highlight. Because yeah. I knew he would kill on this tour. As a producer also, how did you decide okay who's going first, second and last or whatever? I was sitting talk with Mr. Lynn and he after the first year or two he realized i had an idea how a show could flow should go about you know flow yes basically flow and um he took my advice once every once in a while he would try to turn something uh some of the acts around and we would do that and it would work better and he was he was very good when it came to thinking outside the box mm -hmm. so yeah it was his final decision on everything though and the theaters you were talking about are not like small theaters. So they were like thousands of seats. We're talking anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000. And um, the theaters are, in China are probably the most elaborate theaters you will ever see. Really? Staging. The, the actual stage, I would say, are football field deep. Wow. And a football field wide with lighting all the way in the back. And they have so, all yeah. new intelligent lighting and everything, I assume. And... It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, so as stage manager, it was a piece of cake. It was butter for you. Yeah. Well, I didn't stage manage because oh, uh, I did in Beijing for FISM. But what would happen is we would go through the cues and everything. And I wouldn't have to say a word because they once you they wrote it down, they didn't need to know anything else. They didn't need to know the go. Mm -hmm. The only thing we needed to do is – Tell them when the curtain when they open up the curtain. So I would have to go through a translator who would have to translate to the lighting designer or the sound person or the curtain person. In FISM, we were the first um, performance at these theaters. They built these theaters just for FISM. So it was the the competition was a theater next door to the gala show theaters with a wall partition right down the middle. I see. Yeah. So during the day would be the competition. We do tech rehearsal for the evening shows after the competition or or, or in between breaks of the competition. Is that kind of like uh, it, it was in Quebec? Um. Yeah. Yeah. But we're talking both stages, stage shows, not close up and stage. I see. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> in Quebec it was. Close up on one side of the wall, stage on the other. Correct. So it wasn't quite like mm -hmm. that. Okay. Right. No. Gotcha. Now, I know that was just kind of a window in time. So if people who are listening to this saying, hey, I'd love to go to China, I'm going to get, reach out and contact Mike, but that no longer is happening. Mr. Lin retired and um, he gave the tour to a company called uh, Magic Forest, or Magic Woods is what I call it, but Magic Forest. And uh, it's a pretty big company in Beijing. Yeah. And they, they know a lot of the magicians around the world. I still work with them because they put it, they bought a theater or they built a brand new theater. They were doing a, a show, an illusion show. And I commissioned, came up with some ideas for illusions. And the one guy that I work with there is named Borgie, who is very respected in the magic community in Beijing, as well as the U.S. A lot of magicians know him in the U.S. 
and Borgi and I work very close together. So uh, Borgi was the, the uh, basically the director of these shows, but he, I was hired to come up with some ideas. I commissioned Greg Fruin to build the illusions. Hmm. And the stuff that he built was the most incredible thing I've seen. He's one of the best illusion builders I've ever seen. Really? Wow. We uh, we built, he built a full-size ship that was Holy produced cow. on stage. Wow. And, it, and I came up with the idea of a dragon ship. Yeah. It looked like a traditional dragon boat in China. Uh-huh. What he did with that ship is unbelievable. I've never seen anybody so uh, talented when it comes to building and designing illusions. Well, I guess when you're talking about a theater that has yeah, it's a hundred yards wide and deep, you got well. Room. This theater did this. This wasn't a government owned theater. This was oh. built for Magic Forest, and I would say it was maybe about a six seven hundred seat theater. So is that a show that stays there all the time? Then, I, yes. Yeah, okay. I haven't seen it yet. And I just flew out to Beijing back in October for mm -hmm. the Beijing Magic Festival. They flew me out. And I was supposed to go see it, but it was another uh, plane ride to another city, and we didn't have time to go. So, again, that company is kind of taking over the thing, but they're really not doing the tours like you did, though, right? Right. The 30 cities. No, we did it for two years. After 2009, after COVID, it kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. They might go back to it again, but they work very closely with Lu Chen in China. Yeah. And that's like the David Copperfield of magic in China. Was Lu Chen working with the illusionists, touring with them? No, I don't think so. Lu Chen is as big as David Copperfield is here. Mm. Okay. So I don't think he did the illusionist, no. That right. was uh, Yoho Jin. Okay. Jin from Korea. He was on the illusionist. That's who I think I was uh, confusing that with. Um, interesting. So kind of stay and stay tuned, I guess, to see what's going to be happening as to the future of that, yeah. of what's yeah. going to be happening. Now, you live in Philadelphia, and I know that you're a, a big sports fan, obviously, of the Eagles uh, and uh, and everything else. And not only that, of course, of the Smoke and Mirrors Theater that uh, Danny Archer and uh, Marty, Marty Martin. Martin. Marty, Marty Martin. Martin. Yes. Right, right. And um, were you involved at all with the uh, creation of that or some uh, consulting or in, as they put it I together? helped out a little bit. I helped out a little bit. I uh, I would go there like every day when they were building just to look around. And, uh, but Danny had, Danny had this vision of making it like a European style theater, close up theater like they have in Germany and all. He was out there doing a lecture tour and saw it, saw one of the theaters. And he goes, this is my dream. Yeah. They built it, and it was um, it's unbelievable. It's a beautiful sixty seat theater, parlor style magic. Just last weekend, I wasn't there, but they have a guy named Jim Vine from New York and Carl Mercurio, mm -hmm. and Jim Vine did several illusions there. He did the uh, hmm. uh, P, uh, the Wakeland Solomon at one show, mm -hmm. and then he just did uh, Cube Zag and uh, Blake Boyk Stool. Yeah. Uh, illusion there so he's the only person that's brought in illusions to that theater but it's strictly parlor they played pretty well over the weekend yeah i've seen jim at the 4f convention perform several times so uh but i've not right. seen him do illusions that's interesting he's he's a, he's a very good performer very yeah. good performer yeah mm -hmm. um and so they bring in people i mean this what I think is exciting is how there are so many different magic venues, I guess, from uh, around the country that are opening. Like, of course, Smoke and Mirrors has been open for, what, about six, seven years or so? Yeah, about um, six years. Yeah. And uh, but uh, the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Chicago Magic Lounge and House of Cards and uh, 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 what is the one out in Utah? Magnif uh, Magnif uh, uh, that I'm not sure of. Yeah. Uh, there are some different places around the country, I'm saying, you know, that, that magic is being revitalized for live magic. And right. um, it's it's great to uh, to see that they're growing uh, out there. And, and the owners as well. The owners of all those theaters that are within the U.S. They call every Tuesday. Yeah. To talk with each other and come up. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, I was uh, part of that originally when I was going to be the entertainment director for the Magic Island uh, reopening, which uh, I know people ask me frequently, is that going to be opening? And yes, it will be. And uh, But I have since moved from Houston. And as a result, they hired Scott Hollingsworth back again to be the entertainment uh, director. And so he's going to give that uh, another shot for a period of time. And uh, so they're hoping to have that reopened by May or June is kind of what they're, I think they're, they're shooting for at this point. But uh, yeah, I think that that's an important thing that uh, Danny has done to put together all the uh, directors inter of entertainment from these different places. So everybody has an idea kind of what each other's doing and sharing ideas and saying this worked for us. And here's an entertainer you might like to uh, book. Right. And Marty Martin, in my opinion, is probably the most knowledgeable magician I ever met. Hmm. He forgot more magic than 90% of us know. <laughs> That's how good he is. I mean, uh -huh. he, if it wasn't for this guy, I wouldn't be performing the way I'm performing because yeah. he's helped me out so much. And uh, he is the backbone. Uh, Danny had the vision. Marty made it happen. So the two of them work well together. Well, Marty had a magic shop too, as I recall, way back when. Philadelphia Magic Company with Larry Taylor That's years ago. Was. And then when Larry moved away to Florida, Danny Archer stepped in and they became partners, business partners. Yeah, because Danny moved back from from uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Colorado, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I remember going to his shop oh, so many years ago. Um, and when I first met uh, Marty, when I used to travel out that way from, from time to time. Um, and another thing, speaking of Philadelphia and being an Eagles fan, there is a good friend that you have who is not only a, an Eagles uh, per, uh, football star, but also... Right. Uh, professional magician then now so john, about john, john <laughs> he's one of, he's one of the best in my opinion a great story he's a great magician he's got the chops he's a great uh I mean, it's just all around great guy mm -hmm. and uh right now it, he's doing a lot of corporate stuff so i haven't worked with him in a while but um uh, danny garcia has been helping him a lot out Has a he? lot danny mm -hmm. garcia and blake voik um they've been stepping up his magic Mm -hmm. They're coming up with some great ideas for them. Yeah, those two guys together, I know, get together like I think daily and chat about different mm -hmm. ideas and things, and they consult for a lot of people. But I know that you right. had consulted for John for some of his uh, America's Got Talent performances. Yeah, I, I know what he likes. So if I see something, I'll call him up and say, "Hey, you need to get this." Mm -hmm. uh, I would come up with some ideas, but John would make them work. Yeah. You know, um, so if, if he said, I want to try this, I want to do this, why don't you do it this way? And then he would just take off and make it work. He would come up with the story. So most of it's through him because he's pretty creative. He's pretty creative. And he has a very good presentation and personality, it seems like, where he can inject that personality to make people care about what it is that he's doing. Right. And this, his story is an unbelievable story. Um, what is that for people who don't know him as well? This kind of well, being, nutshell. being an NFL football player, um, how he got into magic uh, when he was 12. His father murdered his mother when John was playing baseball. Murdered. And when John, wow. yes, they, they had an argument. And uh, yeah, some, uh, it's in John's show, but he got, he hit his wife over the head with a uh, grinder. Gee, many. Wow. And, you know, he kind of left her in the basement. John came home and he made, sent him to bed she, and said his mother went out for a walk. The next morning, he called the police on himself and they came and arrested him. So, yeah. But wow. it was John was 12 and his sister was a little older than um, Seattle area, Washington. And then they moved to his aunt's house, his mother's sister in California. And he met a kid there who showed him a magic trick. And that's when he just took off. Hmm. Mag magic saved his life, basically. How did he go in that direction of football as opposed to magic then? Uh, well, he was playing football uh, for high school and everything and baseball. He loved sports. And then um, it, this is all in his show, too. And it's in his book. He's got a great book. Uh, uh, life is magic. I think it's life is yeah. Life is magic. Um, and this, the book tells his whole story. But anyway, he sports uh, and he that good. He wasn't getting any um, getting any uh, offers for college scholarships or anything. So what he did was he took 
videos of his friend, a couple of his friends and himself, and collaborated a video and sent it out to colleges as him. Hmm. And back then, just regular camera, so he could splice things here and there. Sure. And they didn't know it, and they thought it was him. Got there, they <laughs> made him a long snapper, and he just worked really hard as a long snapper. And that's how he – and he was a free agent for Buffalo when he got out of college. He wasn't drafted. And then – because he was a free agent for Buffalo – and his first day in Buffalo, I think he said uh, they found out he was a magician. So Jim Kelly brought him to a charity thing and they hopped in a limo and it was Dan Marino, Jim Kelly and all these big name, uh, big name football players and him in a car doing mm -hmm. magic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then uh, after a year, he went to Tennessee because their long snapper got hurt. Then our long snapper in Philadelphia got hurt. Andy Reid back then, uh, John's college coach, Texas El Paso, and they asked him to give him a shot. So he flew him in. John pulled a groin or, or something. He couldn't really do anything. And they mm -hmm. just hired him on the spot as a favor for his coach. And he was, he was there for 10 years. Wow. But then, but then he got traded to New Orleans for, for a seventh round pick. After his preseason game, he was supposed to get a physical, and that's when they found out he had um, heart murmur, aneurysms, aneurysm, oh. and he had to go through emergency surgery, mm -hmm. and he would never play football again. So now he's doing magic full time, and very successful at it. That's from what I understand. He's on corporate jets, flying here and there and everywhere. He's unbelievable. He's a great, great magician, and if anybody has a chance to see him. Go to one of his shows. And as an after-dinner speaker, so he's like a motivational type of a guy too? Yes. And I guarantee you'll walk away. Inspired? Um, yes. Guarantee. I've seen it a thousand times. And it's it's very inspiring. Yeah. Bring tears to uh, people's eyes, I guess, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And a lot, lot of laughs. Now, I mentioned the uh, AGT, uh, and one of the things, too, I think when people get on America's Got Talent is they don't look at that as a long-term thing necessarily. In other words, if they get past the first one, it's like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Or if they get past the first second, the, the, then they don't know what to do for the third. Right. Well, you're supposed to have Eric Chen. Let me sit up here. Eric Chen, who was on years ago, he won Asia's Got Talent. Mm-hmm. He only needed three spots there. Well, America's got talent. You need at least five or six. Five or six, right. And he wasn't prepared for that. Because hmm. uh, he was on our tour in China, and we let him go early August of 2019 and brought in Shempe to take the rest of the tour over. And uh, Eric flew to do AGT and did a couple spots, and then – he was he made it to the semifinals and he had to work on the routine and I helped him out with the routine. Then all of a sudden, three days before it was supposed to air, they told him he couldn't do that routine. Wow. So he had he had to come up with something brand new within three days. And that was his last bit he did that didn't go over too well. But it wasn't his fault. He was ready, all ready to go, and they wouldn't allow him to do why it. didn't why wouldn't but, they allow him to do what he wanted to do? <sighs> Probably copyright infringement with huh. Legos. I had oh. I came up with a routine for him with Legos, and I flew out there. As soon as I got back from Beijing, the next day I flew to L.A. with all my props to work on it and help him out. Once I got there, three days before the show, they said, no, we're going to go in a different direction. Can you come up with something else? Well, as I'm flying out there, when I got there, that's when I found out. And he came up with this thing that he did on the last episode with a, a map and little landmarks and stuff. But oh, yeah, it, was I all, that. it was only like two or three days that he had to come up with that. Yeah. And I thought he did great within with those two or three days, but they kind of screwed him over in my opinion. Well, and I remember Kevin James telling me about how that he had been requested to change his act then also, and they wanted him to do that 
thing that he'd invented with the hand that looks like you're yeah. holding a hand, you know, with a glove or something. And uh, it's sold commercially. And he said, no, yep. I really don't want to do that. And they said, well, we want you to do that. And he said, no, I don't. He said, yes, we will. So he ended up doing it. And of course, that's whenever the the uh, judges were saying, well, that's something that everybody does. And so they he didn't go forward because, and, and then later, I understand he could have forced his way saying, no, I'm definitely going to do what I want to do and not what you want me to do. Right. He could have. Yes. Yes, he could have. But I think it depends on the contract. So it sounds like from what... Uh, he was going to be doing um, that uh, they wanted him to, because of the copyright thing, I understand, I guess they didn't want to have the Legos or blocks or whatever kind of thing. It's a really good routine. I've been doing it for a while. It's a really good routine. He, does he sell he it commercially? Just... Okay. So it's just mine. it's mine. shared it with, uh, okay. <laughs> he was the only person I shared it with. And then he was going to do a big, um, New Year's celebration in China, which if you're on this TV show, you are set for life. That's how Lu Chen became very big in China because of this New Year's Eve show. Uh -huh. And uh, he came up with something that's 10 times better than what I came up with. I'll show you a video. I can't show it on here because I don't want anybody else to see it. Yeah. But when I see you, you ask me and I'll show you just a snippet of it, of okay. what he does. Wow. It's unbelievable. <laughs> he won't be doing he won't be doing it at Magic Texas. Uh but it's really good. Amazing. Well, uh as we close over here, I want to again congratulate you on the upcoming uh, special fellowship award that is uh, well deserved. And you as well. Well, thank you sir very much. You as well, yeah. <laughs> but they they should know that you're receiving that award as well for what I, you do. I do. We both will be sitting together and uh, going up on stage and uh giving them thanks for uh, for the recognition of the uh, of what we have contributed, but you have certainly contributed a lot. And then for those who may not have known you as well, perhaps that uh, through this episode, they'll uh, know and appreciate you a lot more than as well. I certainly do as a friend have for years and that uh, I admire you and thank, thank you for everything that you've done. I admire you because I remember me, well, we, we met at 4F, but a couple of times at uh, yeah. uh, Magi Fest, you and I would go get coffee and come back. And, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I appreciate it. Yep. And so uh, before we close, the name of my podcast is called The Magic Word. So I always like to find out what it is that is your magic word. What's your philosophy of life? What's important to you? Uh, one day at a time. One, Take it one day at a time. One day at a time. You know, just, the, you know, I, I try not to let things bother me. Sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. When I go bowling, bowl a bad game, sometimes I, I used to get really upset. Now I just laugh. Uh, so, yeah. It's just one day at a time, one minute at a time. Well, after uh, you'd said where Hank Morehouse had 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 passed away when he was overseas, it's like you never know what uh, if tomorrow is going to bring even exactly. sunshine for you. You know, so live exactly. today, one day at a time. I'm I've been selling a lot of stuff online. Mm -hmm. I've had several magicians that are very close to me pass away, and one friend who was like a brother died two years ago and when I went into a storage unit it was a 10 by 30 with 50 different theme shows for preschool and elementary kids mm. I'm selling his stuff I'll be selling and I made a promise at his deathbed that I would sell the stuff for his wife yeah. so she would get proper money and I've been doing it for the past two and a half years and I'll probably do it for another three four years that's how much stuff he has wow Dick Gufferson who just passed away Yes. I've been selling all his stuff with Tom Ewing for Haberstadt and Ewing Auctions mm -hmm. uh, for the, his family. Uh, Bob Little, I'm selling his stuff for his family and running the convention. And the money that's made for that convention goes into the SM Endowment Fund to help to pay for a kid's scholarship to go to camp, like Tannins Camp or any other magic camp. That that's they nice. Want. Yeah. That's great. So things like that's what's happening. So people are calling me up to sell their magic and it's getting ridiculous. Yeah. As we get older, that this, uh, the end is always nigh. <laughs> so and live one day why, at a time. Exactly. Because the Hank Morehouse and my friend Tom. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Mike, thanks very much again. I appreciate your, your time and your words. Thank you. You bet. Thank so you. for the magic Word podcast, that was Mike Miller. This is Scotty out. 
I want to thank Mike for being my guest here this week on the Magic Word Podcast. And I want to thank you for coming and listening each week to the podcast then as well. I want to thank all of the subscribers who have joined the mailing list for the pod letter. And if you have not done that, all you need to do is go to themagicwordpodcast.com. There should be a little pop-up that will come up and that way that you can subscribe to the pod letter. And each week we will send you just a very short announcement, basically saying who's on this week, who's coming up next week, and suggestions from the archives. And from week to week, we happen to have contests, and we will announce those also in the pod letter. So subscribers are the first ones to know about that if you just subscribe. Also, one thing that will really help us, of course, if, if you can just go out to iTunes and give us a five-star rating and uh, nice comments, or if you listen through another type of a podcast uh, platform, whether it's going to be on Spotify or iTunes or, or iHeartRadio or wherever it is, I'm sure there are ways that you can give us five-star reviews and that will help our podcast grow. We certainly appreciate it. And if you have the financial uh, wherewithal in order to help us with the, the podcast, we do have a lot of expenses that are associated with this every week when we're producing this. And so it will be helpful if you could pledge through Patreon or through PayPal. And you can also donate through PayPal if you want to do a one-time pledge from time to time. We have several people who also, whenever I'm at a magic convention, will hand me some cash and they go towards uh, this and they become friends of the magic word. And there are a lot of perks you can get also as a patron if uh, you do pledge from month to month. Well, I think we need to wrap up here this week. Again, I want to thank uh, Mike Miller for uh, joining us. And we've got uh, several more great uh, episodes that are going to be coming up here soon, as well as uh, soon be reporting from the 4F convention. That's Fector's Finger Flicking Frolic coming up in Buffalo. So that's going to be at the end of April. And that'll be some daily reports you'll be hearing from that. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember... Don't let things bother you and take one day at a time. This is Scotty out. <laughs>